WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. Uh, we are doing some uh, great conversations here around the holidays and uh, setting stuff up. We're doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour as well. I was at Costas this week uh, with some great friends, Rob Santoni uh, from Wise Markets, as well as John Martin from the Maryland Lottery. Uh, we have been getting around for the holidays with some Baltimore Magazine chats. And Don Moeller, the executive producer of this portion uh, of our uh, of our crab cake tour and other things. You, you know, I, I told you, get some big shots on the show, you know? Let's get some sports legends, some people in politics, and uh, we'd love to have him out for a crab cake. We'll do that next year. And, and Dom, when you brought this guest on, you actually green room me and said, have you ever had this guy on before? <laughs> It's my 30th anniversary this week. I mean, in 30 years, I think I've done like 25,000 hours of radio, literally that much, over the course of time. And yes, I have had this guest on one time, and it was like 27 years ago. How about that? There you go. Well, we welcome former congressman, uh, Maryland basketball great, uh, Tom McMillan. And Tom, welcome to Baltimore Positive. Well, it's great to be on, and it's good to see you, Don, a few weeks ago, and Happy to be with you. So, oh, it's terrific. I'm going to tell Nestor. You don't know this story. One of my, I, I, these are the I ones thinking, I love the best, Tom. The well, ones I don't know. I was thinking about having Tom on. Tom McMillan. He probably he doesn't know this either. Tom McMillan has been in my life in one way or the other now <laughs> for 52 years, and I'm going to tell you this. People are going to listen to this story, Tom, and they're going to go, "Ah, oh, come on." Moore's making that up, but it's 1970, and this is going to get us to the big birthday bash that's coming up. I'm at Western Maryland College <clears throat> as a sophomore, and one of my good buddies down the hall, uh, David Solo, walks into my room, and he goes, he called me D.I. That was my nickname. He said, D.I. He said, uh, I'm, I'm transferring. I said, what do you, what do you mean you're transferring? We're, we like it here at Western Maryland I got to go to Maryland. I got to go be a Terp. I said, what? You're going to transfer from where? I've got to. They got Tom McMillan and Len <laughs> Elmore. <laughs> I need to be there. So you literally forced people to transfer colleges 50-some years ago because rather than go play for Dean Smith down there in North Carolina, the left-hander, who said you guys were going to be UCLA the East, got Tom McMillan to come to Maryland. How the hell did Lefty do that? Well, it's, I'll give you the short version. Um, you know, I had committed to Carolina. I really liked Dean Smith. Um, thought he was such a classy guy. Love, love Lefty, too. Uh, but, you know, it just was in my heart to go to Carolina. And then in the summer before I went to school, my father got real ill. And my father loved to see me play, and I, I started rethinking it. And uh, Coach Giselle got back in the picture. And, uh, you know, largely because I wanted to have my father see me play and be close to Maryland and also the nation's capital that, you know, I chose Maryland. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do was to tell Dean Smith I wasn't going to go to Carolina, but he was so classy about it. How'd you do that? You, you call him like on the phone, old no. school, right? Well, no, back then, you know. I didn't decide to go to Maryland till about midnight the night before uh, before the registration ended. I was packing for college, literally not knowing which college I was going to. There was a Virginia coach in my house playing cards with my parents. He had a plane down the street. Uh, I'm calling my brother and said, who was at dental school, medical school at Maryland? I said, get up here if you want me to come to Maryland. He got to the house about one o'clock and I sent a telegram to Dean and said, you know, I'm going to Maryland. So Dean was in Europe by the time. Well, what, time. What, so, so you sent a telegram to Dean and now you go to Maryland. What, yeah. what about it? I mean, give, give me the, the, the platter speech. Cause this is probably a good time to talk about lefty, right. And lefty's involvement yeah. and, and, and why we're all here together. And, and I pinged you a couple of weeks ago and Don was trying to get you out to Beaumont last week for a crab cake. stuff. So I said, this is a perfect time to come on because these stories of lefty. And I had, uh, I had Don Marcus on last week, you know, after Turgeon and, and all that happened. And we, we were telling some stories as well. Uh, Lefty's one of the great, um, what one of the great characters, one of the great people, one of the great coaches that over the last fifty years here that we've had. Well, and he's turning ninety on Christmas Day. I'm going to send Don the invitation for anybody that wants to get on the on this Zoom virtual birthday party. 
It's lefty90.com. Anybody can <laughs> sign up. We have Coach K. We have Scott Van Pelt. We have, uh, you know, uh, Billy Packer, Lenny Elmore. So Don you don't have Luke. to spend 500 bucks and, like, go and eat no. rubber chicken and, 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 like, get dressed up and people drink too much. This is just literally an online love and roast kind of thing for lefty yes uh johnny holiday's the host and it's a uh, it's going to be we have i think we have thousands of people signed up for it it's a you know lefty's wife died a few months ago and you know he's been um, you know he's been um, getting up there in age and so we want to do something special for him so you know lefty was indefatigable in recruiting me and my father loved him very much my mother really liked him and he just never accepted that I wasn't going to come to Maryland. The other thing that happened to me, which is interesting, President Nixon earlier that year had appointed me to the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. I was the youngest presidential appointee at 17 years old and still am. Uh, so one of the things going to Washington, I was able to go to the White House and do this President's Council meetings and James Lovell, the astronaut, was our chair. So there were a lot. So of Nixon recruited you to College Park. Is that what you're telling no, no, me right no, now? No, no, the White House. <laughs> no, he appointed me. He appointed me to the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sport, which, at 17 years old, I I, I believe I'm still the youngest presidential appointee ever. So. Well, that was part of it. You you had in mind where your life was going to go above and beyond the basketball, right? Like, even at that point, you're thinking, ah, D.C.'s closer to to College Park than, let's say, you know, Chapel Hill or some other place. Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is I I was a chemistry major at Maryland. I was pre-med. I was really tough curriculum. And I really, even though I worked in the Senate, uh, Joe Tidings got me a position in the Senate, and uh, I was on that presidential commission. You know, I, you know, I thought about politics, um, but I really didn't get into politics until I went to Oxford on the Rhodes Scholarship. And, and I actually, I shifted majors. I went from chemistry to, I got a master's in politics, philosophy, and economics at Oxford. So, um, you, you, got, you glossed over that. I mean, we, Nestor and I have had a couple, not many, Rhodes Scholars. You say, yeah, I went to Oxford. Everyone that's a Rhodes Scholar, it's like, yeah, well, right. I did the Rhodes Scholar, and then they move on yeah, to the next thing, and I'm like, whoa, on, whoa, 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 there's a book right. there, yeah. right? Tom, you're, you're playing, and I really want you to, I want you to take our listeners inside of that. I, I know, I've i seen some D1 athletes. Yeah. Now, I, I don't remember in 1970, when you were at Maryland, and we're going to talk about to this day, what's the greatest college basketball game ever played in my mind. But today they own you as a D one player. I mean, you're up at five in the morning, you're practicing mm-hmm. late at night. Um, how does a D one player playing for one of, you know, one of the best teams in the nation traveling all over the country, keep his grades to the point where he becomes a road scholar. You got, you, you got to give us some insight there, those of us who are parents and grandparents. Well, uh, first of all, a chemistry major has labs every afternoon. So I would show up for practice 10 to 15 minutes late. It was always very tough. I had to stay up all night studying. But here's the thing. You know, I ended up being uh, one of the great honors in my life was to, to be the valedictorian, to give the valedictorian address in Maryland. So the only way I was able to do it was that I worked like I worked every weekend. I studied you know, all night long. I mean, it was really hard. It was very difficult to be a chemistry major and play college basketball, just to put it that was way. Was basketball that easier major. for you? Was that like the outlet of like not having your face in a book? Because I, so many athletes in the modern era for me, you know, other than video games, dude, it's all they got. You know what I mean? Like well, it's what they do. You had a whole other thing. And these guys work 24 hours a day on basketball to play 12 years in the NBA like you did, right? Yeah, and I was, you know, I was on that presidential commission. Governor Mandela, I was chairman of a student body group uh, at, for the state. I mean, I was active in a lot of things. But I'm just telling you, there are players that very rarely today does anybody major in chemistry it's, or, or you know, it's engineering. Those are really tough curriculums. And uh, sometimes I amaze myself that I was able to do that. So, you know, it, it's hard. And, you know, the I can't say it was relief because those are very tough courses. They're, they're not easy. So, uh, Tom, t- talk a little bit. You got this big birthday bash, December the 26th. 
It's 90 years old for lefty. What, what, what's the time on the 26th again for folks? It's at 5 o'clock. Anybody can sign up at lefty90.com. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, Lenny Elmore and I are hosting Johnny Holiday's EMC. We've got Gary Williams, Mark Turgeon. We've got mm. Coach K. We've got Scott Van Pelt, Billy Packer, Fred Hetzel. All the luminaries who Coach Lefty worked with over the years uh, will be part of it. And John Lucas, Adrian Branch, uh, Albert King, I can go down the list. It's uh, well, remarkable. It's my list. childhood, it's Tom. <laughs> and I'm saying, yeah. that's right, it is. And, and it's my young adulthood. Um, talk to us. I would think that folks that are listening in their car or sitting at their computer now, uh, you talked about what a gentleman Dean was. You talked about your dad loved Lefty. Tell us not about the left-hander as a coach, because people get in and out of strategy. I don't care so much about the strategy. Talk about Lefty, the man, Tom, the man that you knew then and the man that you know now. Take us inside, Lefty. You know, I didn't see the really more human side of him. He could be he could be tough as his nails. I remember we used to go to Carolina. If we ever lost a game down there, we never stayed at that hotel again or ate in that restaurant. I mean, he was just <laughs> – he had a superstitious side to him, but he had a, you know, when my father died my senior year, I mean, he took the, he arranged for the whole team to go to the funeral up in Pennsylvania. I mean, he's just, you know, uh, it was people don't realize about him. He, you know, he has a kind of this deep Christian side to him. He's really a very human person. Uh, he and Dean fought like hell. They were bitter enemies. But one thing that always struck me, when Dean was dying, Lefty reached out to him many times and they had long conversations. And I mean, really, that's the kind of person he is. Tom yes, Millen is our guest. Uh, you know, Tom, I, I, Don introduces you. And I, and, and see, so, you know, before we came on, like, had you been in my studio, you came and did my show at the Lord Baltimore, like in 1994. Yeah. And when you came in at that point, I don't even think I talked anything about politics at all. Or, you know, to me, you were an NBA player. You were the Maryland guy who played, you know, a dozen years in the NBA. I, I, you know, I, I guess people don't, do people talk a lot of basketball with you at this point or, or do they even mention 12 years in the NBA? Because it feels like for a lot of people that would be their resume for you it's like about the fifth thing we get to well no people are always talking about you know basketball politics olympics you know they they talk to me about a lot all those subjects you know so it's, i can't say that's one or the other everybody loves to talk to me about college basketball because that's what i do now but it's just uh you know it's just uh many subjects i should say well before we get to the politics and you have a first hand i i i i, I for folks who think that gerrymandering is a <laughs> new phenomena, uh, you actually have a sort of a firsthand uh, experience way back when with a little bit of a gerrymandered district. We'll get we'll get to that. But, Tom, you ha were involved when you think of your history in basketball, mm -hmm. you were involved in two of the most remarkable basketball games in the history of the sport, and I don't think that will ever change. And I'm going to take them out of chronological order. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start in 74, because if a 24-year-old Don Mower can have his heart broken, he had it broken uh, on that day when the Terps lost 103 to 100 to NC State, In to this day, the greatest college basketball First college game. basketball game I remember ever. seeing. So, so like I was five, end. five years old, six years of five and a half years old at that time. And changed so, yeah. March Madness forever. Right. Tom, take us back to that day, that game and, and, and that roster. You know, I don't think people realize I, I go down that roster. Tom McMillan, Len Elmore, Mo Howard, Owen Brown, Jack Trimble, uh, Tom Roy. Uh, Billy Hahn. I mean, it's an incredible. John Lucas. John, John Lucas. Lucas. John Lucas at the point. I mean, take us back to that team and that game and the aftermath. I just can't imagine. Well, I think there were six players that ended up playing in the NBA out of that, uh, both teams. Um, you know, I played with Tom Burleson on the 72 Olympics and in the NBA, so I knew him pretty well. And, you know, they were North Carolina State was a great team. And, by the way, Lefty and uh, Norm Sloan were really good pals. Uh, and, uh, 
you know, he didn't have that same relationship with Dean Smith, but he got along well with Norm. And Norm had put together an extraordinary team. David Thompson was probably, he was the Michael Jordan before they ever heard of Michael Jordan. Right. He, I've never seen he, anybody he jump touch, like him in person. He could touch the top right. of the backboard. I mean, he hit his like, head on the, ba- on, on, the, on the backboard, right? Yeah. I, I, I remember, Tom, top. I don't know if it was urban legend or not. I remember, because I saw him play at college. But I never saw anybody leap like that. I, the urban legend was he could get a dime off the top of the backboard. Yeah, I'll send you a picture of him just about doing that. And uh, I was working with the North Carolina State folks because they're trying to honor him uh, for his astounding career. But it was just a great basketball play, a game. It was well played, you know, very few turnovers. Uh, you know, that in the uh, Duke-Kentucky game were always considered the two best college games. But, uh, you know, it, it just – the point of it is it changed college basketball. There were only 16 teams that got into the NCAA. So you had to win the ACC, uh, and that was no easy league. You know, when Maryland won in 2002, they did not win the ACC championship. So Maryland would have been suffering. Maryland under Gary's team would have suffered the same fate of us unless they didn't. They changed the rules after that game. They went from 16 to 32. Now they went to 68. Well, remember, we won the NIT my freshman year, my sophomore year. There were only 16 teams in the NIT and 16 in the NCAA. So winning the NIT back then was like a national championship, but people don't consider it such. We did that my sophomore year. And then my senior year, if we would have beaten State, we would have, in all probability, you know, won the uh, national title. Uh, State beat Bill Walton at UCLA, no, no easy team. And remember, we only lost to them at UCLA by one point. So it's uh, also one of the greatest games. I remember that was, if yeah. I remember back here on the East coast, that was late at night and yeah. we were, I can remember where I actually watched. That Tell game. me about that game. Was that Walton? Yeah, it was Walton, Jamal Wilkes. They had a great team and we were playing Paulie Pavilion. They hadn't lost in about 80 games. We had the ball. We were down by one. We could have easily won it, uh, but we, we didn't get a shot off. That would have broken Pauly, the whole Pauly Pavilion, John Wooden legend. But that game was the first game of our season that year. And, you know, and uh, it shows you how close we were to, to, uh, to being the best team in the country. So To becoming and, the UCLA of the East. Hey, by the way, Tom, did you, did, did, have you read over the last 30 years all of the Wooden books that have come out or any of them at all? Because no, I've read I, a couple of them, yeah. I'm such a wooden guy. We we share the same birthday. He actually did my show on our birthday like 20 yeah. years ago when he was still alive. So I, you know, what what that was that sort of north star for basketball. Lefties came so close to chasing it, right? I mean, it, as we talk about lefty in this, that UCLA of the East thing sticks with him. It, you know, he, 50 years later. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. By the way. Lefty was scrupulously honest. I mean, he never, ever crossed the line on anything. You know, and you read about UCLA, and there's a guy named Sam Gilbert, and, you know, I don't know if John Wood knew any of it, but but I can tell you Lefty never ran his program that way. He ran it you know, pristine and clean. And, uh, you know, look at his record at Maryland. He was like almost 69%. I think he's probably had the best record ever at Maryland as a coach. And so uh, – and it wasn't easy back then. Today you play guaranteed games. In other words, you pay seventy-five thousand to a small, you know, school to come lose at Maryland, and that's what that's what they do now. We never had that. We had to play, you know, uh, you know, we played against teams straight up. And the other thing is that you know when you look at records, uh, we only played we played five to seven less games today than they do now. We didn't have a three-point line. The game is so much different. Um, and so you, you have to look at Lefty's record in perspective. Um, could fre- I'm, I, I should know this. I'm thinking back. Could freshmen play? But it changed right. The freshmen couldn't play back then, right? Right, until, until the next year. And that's why John Lucas played. But right. I could not play as a freshman. So That's uh, what I remember. You and Elmore were on the freshman team. That's right, right. That's people. I mean, think about that. Man, we're like, yeah, I mean, we're in a, like, it's, it's like Jetsons, what we're doing now, right? Like. Well, 
And, and how much different your life with recruiting would be and you wearing your little Maryland cap on ESPN when, yeah. when you're 15 because they were – whatever they're doing, AAU, all of that, right? Well, oh, then, so Nestor, different. think it's... about think about with Tom and, – and I actually got chills, Tom, looking at it again, getting ready for this interview. I, I then I want to go back two years mm-hmm. from 74 to the 72 Olympics, the Munich Massacre. And I not only want you to talk about being there, the massacre, and it's the Jim McKay, they're all gone. And um, set the, the, the framework for the U.S.-Soviet game and everything that's happening in the Cold War. And the context is your team, the American team, has won seven straight gold medals. They were 63 and 0. And in the games of the Munich massacre, here comes the gold medal game with truly the most bizarre three seconds ever in the history of basketball. And I'm going to shut up and have you tell our listeners what I'm talking about because it, well, it's, it's bizarre. Five, five days before that game, you know, we got up in the morning and the Israeli athletes, uh, athletes had been taken hostage. They were later murdered by the uh, Arab terrorists. That all occurred in Olympic Village. That was like so foreign. Terrorism was not a word that you even understood back in 1972. And here you have an Olympic Village shut down by it. Yet, you know, we had to continue to go on, practice, uh, get ready for our game against the Soviet Union. And we were the youngest Olympic basketball team ever the soviets really had pros they just they were pros but they said they were soldiers or workers so they got classified as amateurs so none of our pros played and uh you know we were as you said 63 and 0 we had a coach it was very old-fashioned hank i but we were not really suited for the fast-paced team we had but yet we came from behind uh and we ended up doug collins hit these uh, game ending free throws to put us up uh, with one point to go with three seconds. And then they continued to replay the clock three times uh, once, once because an official like the NBA commissioner came out of the stands and said, you must reset the clock. That would be like, as I said, the NBA commissioner coming out of the stands and resetting the clock at NBA championship. And only on the third time did the Soviets, uh, Prevail. Well, well, well Tom, you're being you're being a little modest here because there's a guy named Tom McMillan who plays a key part in this, guarding the inbounds play three right. times. I was right? on, I was on the ball, and there was a Russian, there was an official there, I think from Romania or Bulgaria, I didn't speak English, and he's yelling at me, and I'm assuming because the he's yelling at me and pointing at the line. Under international rules, you can stay right up to the line as long as the player can go backwards and I'm there and he's yelling at me. And I said, you know, I don't want to get a technical slide back off because, you know, that's the last thing you want to do is lose a game like that, a technical. And then of course uh, he throws the ball, the Russian, the Russian, the Soviet throws the ball down to this guy, Alexander Bailoff. He gets it and lays it in. Uh, We, it was funny, Howard Cosell the next day was the one that, fought our case in front of this little appeals board, which was made of five folks. Three of them were Eastern Bloc countries. And the vote went three to two. The Eastern Bloc countries all voted against us. And we, at that point, refused to accept the silver medal. So our silver medals are sitting in a vault in Switzerland. Next year is the 50th anniversary. I've been working with the International Olympic League. I am trying to get those medals into a museum in America because if we don't do it now, they're going to be there a thousand thousand years from now. So I felt that it was important that we we try to get them into the United States in some museum, either Smithsonian or the Basketball Hall of Fame. But, you know, it's a very monumental game. Again, that game was the start of changing the Olympics because they went to the dream team. After we lost again in 88, they said, we're going to go to the dream team and allow pros to play in the Olympics. And and what happened, that game probably meant more to the NBA than anybody else because it internationalized basketball. It gave people hope in, uh, you know, all these countries around the world. And today the NBA is 22% international. And um, 
so that game was really a key pivotal point, I think, in the growth of the NBA. Tom McMillan is our guest. Don Moeller is here, former Baltimore County executive. We're doing some Baltimore positive here, talking about lefties' 90th and uh, old storytelling. And uh, and then there's the politics part, right? Like, we haven't even gotten to that part, right, Tom? Hey, Nestor, real quick, before we jump to the politics part and lead one that Tom's doing, I have one more question about 72, and yep. I want to see if it's accurate or if you recall it. Some of what I've read has indicated that Hank Iba and the staff momentarily, when they were asked to re throw the ball in two more times after the game was over, to consider just saying, look, Collins hit the free throws. The game's over. Let's go to the locker room. We won the gold medal. But he was afraid of a forfeit. Is that urban legend or is that accurate? No, I think that's right. Um, you know, if he had gone to the locker, which is probably in retrospect what, what we should have done. Uh they might have very well forfeited, you know, the way the Olympics works. But, uh, you know, it's funny. We, uh, 50 years later, it's still hard to get those medals out. The IOC, my teammates, quite frankly, don't, will never, ever concede that they did not win the game. So the trick I'm dealing with with the IOC is that I want the medals to be released to an attorney, and then the attorney sends them to the museum because none of my teammates will accept them. So this is a very tricky thing for the IOC because they normally only give them to the athletes. Well, the question is, if they don't give them this way to a conduit so that we can put it in a museum, guess what? They're going to be holding them 300 years from now. And right. every four years, they keep writing that story. It doesn't make the IOC look very good. So I'm trying to bring some closure to it. Well, good, good luck with that. And we would be remiss... Uh, before we let you get out of here, uh, we, we the three of us lost, uh, and you you were very warm and reminiscent uh, in your memories of our buddy Ted Venatoulis when he passed away, and you and I reconnected at that point. And Ted would be saying, "All right, you got to you got to get Tom into politics. You got because you and you and Ted, you know, although Ted was a sports fan, you guys were really joined." By politics and your your three terms in the house from from oh, at ni uh, ni 97 to 203, mm -hmm. I guess. And then in an effort to create my memory of it, Tom, and you, you walk me through if my history is wrong, is that we then moved in Maryland to try to create a, a majority minority district, mm -hmm. which got you redistricted out of the, the fourth and put you in the, the first, which was pretty competitive with a moderate Republican who couldn't be a Republican today, right. Wayne Gilchrist, and, and lost a tough race. Um, talk about the Congress you served in versus the Congress today, Tom, because you're still very involved down there on the Hill. Yeah, And so one thing is interesting to note, and I don't think this record will ever be broken. I announced for Congress before my last NBA season, and I played a whole NBA season as candidate for Congress. And wow. it was the NBA player of the week my last year in the NBA. So I was an NBA player running for Congress. And Bill Bradley told me to do that. Ted encouraged it. Lots of people. I mean, that was just sort of an unusual thing. I don't think anybody will ever do that. Today, you know, I was talking to some former members last night at a reception for the Secretary of Commerce. And we were just talking about it. It's just uh, John Delaney I was talking to, you know, former Maryland congressman. And he says, you know, a lot of the Republicans will say privately, you know, they, you know, they realize that what happened on the, on the, on the, on the six was terrible, but it, it, we're just caught in this situation where everybody goes to their corners. And that wasn't the case when I was in the house, the house had a big middle. We had 60, 70 moderate members, maybe 80 when you add the Republicans and, and that, that, coalition really drove the results of congress it could well tom you probably had better people right i mean you didn't have people that saw their building charged by people and then afterward wanted to have amnesia that it never happened i mean it's it's outrageous that people don't want that that people have tried to halt the investigation into an insurrection i mean it's gross it's it's and yeah. i would think for someone like you that served in that building that this it would be offensive well, I mean, they're good. They've always been good people serving in Congress. What's happened is our system has pushed everybody to the corners. And 
that's not good because the Democrats are a lot of them are in their corner and the Republicans are not in their in their corner. And that creates this sort of, uh, you know, the, these extremes. And we see this and it's it's right. You're right. It, it, for me to see what happened to the Capitol was just so sobering to me. But the reason is that we've got to get away from everybody running to their corner. Our, our media is that way. Everything is that way. And it, it the only point I'm making, it wasn't that way when I was in Congress. There were there were the extremes, but there were also a big body central that kind of drove the, you know, drove the legislation and the results that we were able to deliver. So, Tom, you mentioned, and it's always fascinating to Nestor and me, you mentioned and when I was running and I was still in the NBA, Ted encouraged me. I mean, the, 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 I, I call it the if there's six degrees of Kevin Bacon, there were six degrees and who never knows what of our friend Ted Venetool was give us before we have you catch us, take us out of here with the discussion of lead one. Give us your favorite memory of Ted Venetool was over the years. Oh gosh, I have so many, but you know, I used to always see him at the conventions. You know, he was, uh, he was very proud of uh, speaker Pelosi and he always would, you know, the, there were, there were always events with her that I enjoyed being with, you know, and, Ted was Baltimore to the core and uh, you know, he was always proud. He always had these annual events for her and, you know, I've seen you at them, Don, and you know, he just, he, um, but he was all, you know, he's always really very uh, good about it. He wasn't like a hard sell. He just, he just encouraged people because he cared deeply about democracy in our country. And uh, plus he had just a good, nice way about him. You know, it wasn't like there was in a hard edge and, you know, I, I remember back, he was kind of the he was sort of the Kennedy figure in Maryland. So uh, when I was in school, you know, in the 70s, 74, you know, that's sort of and after that was sort of Ted's emergence. So he was always so, somewhat of a mentor to me, he helped me, gave me advice and everything. So, so sorry to see him leave. Yeah. I love the Ted story, Tom, and you, you'll remember it. And Nestor, you were you're probably too young, but when he ran, Jerry, this is vintage Ted, right? When he ran Jerry Brown's successful presidential uh, candidacy, primary candidacy for president in Maryland, it was Ted that dreamed up that the campaign button, Nestor, would just be Brown. It wouldn't say Brown. It wouldn't say anything. <laughs> the campaign button was Brown. I, mean, I remember that. Vintage. Well, don't, don't you think it's very interesting that Ted and Marvin Mandel were on that for different reasons. Remember yes. that? Because yes. Marvin wasn't happy with Jimmy Carter. And uh, yeah, there was just a lot of uh, interesting politics there. Yeah. Well, Ted, Ted, I always say one of the wisest and most insightful strategists. And as you said, partially, Tom, not partially, I would say primarily because of his deep love of country and feeling of what this country should be. We're with Tom McMillan. Famous congressman, famous Maryland basketball player. He was there in the Olympics in 72. He was in the greatest basketball game ever played in 74. Tom, there's no grass growing under you. Uh, tell us about Lead One, what it is and what you're trying to do. Well, Lead One's been around for 1986, but it's the all the biggest schools in college sports. It's all what's called the FBS, 130 schools. They represent about $8 billion, $9 billion of college athletic programs. Hard to believe. It includes everything, you know, from softball to women's sports to men's sports. And what we do is we work on all the big issues in college sports. Uh, we work with the NCAA on some things. We fight with, them, fight with them on other. So we actually represent those schools in the AD. Maryland and, uh, Maryland and Navy are two of our schools. In Maryland, but we have Notre Dame, Alabama, UCLA, Texas, you know, who's who in college sports. And so the ADs, the athletic directors of those schools, uh, selectively are on our, on, on our board. So that's kind of what we do. We work on all the kind of big policy issues, transfers, transfer portals, name, image, and like. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I can't let you, I can't let you blow players. by that one. Yeah. Woo! If that's not one of the most controversial uh, things. My dad would come back and say, um, Mr. McMillan, what's a transfer portal? Right. So I, where are you on that, Tom? <laughs> well, I mean, as I said, the cows are kind of on the ball, out of the barn on that one. But, you know, they've allowed, 
I mean, what, what has always happened in college sports is if the coaches could do something, the athletes say, why not us? So the coaches making millions of dollars, the athletes say, why not us? I wrote a book when I was in Congress called Out of Bounds. I said, we just had our first million dollar college coach. I said, look, if you don't slow that down, you're going to have a million dollar athlete someday because they're going to demand it. So the whole idea on the transfers, coaches can leave their buyouts and all that. So the players say, well, why shouldn't we be have some rights to leave? And that's what's driven this. I mean, I don't think a lot of our the establishment's happy about it because the rosters are turning over so much that it's hard to build the allegiance. You know, in Maryland, you know, they knew I was going to be there for four years, the Lenny. Today, they don't know how long these kids are going to be there. And I'm not sure in the long run that's good for the college product. Because Look, today, Tom, Tom, that's a great point. Today, you and Lenny would be one and dones. Pro- yeah, well, maybe gone. not you, because you wanted to be a Rhodes guy. And Lenny's smart too. Maybe not, because of well, your I mean, passion. I, I mean, just to give you a quick point, when I was a freshman at Maryland, the owner of the Buffalo Drays tried to get me to come out early. He wanted to make a court case of it. He was going to pay me for go to Harvard in the summer. Wow. And obviously I didn't do it, but you know, there would have been a lot of tempting opportunities to leave. And that's I don't think that's necessarily good for college sports. Uh, it hasn't been. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, but the other part of this, and I've been on this for the last 15 years since I grew up and became an adult. Yeah. I put on March madness the first day and I see all this money, all these fantasy things, all these teams, all these coaches, you know, the smaller schools, but the top 30 schools, all the coaches are making millions and millions of dollars. And I'm thinking, Everybody, the CBS crew's making money. Everybody's making money, except the guys doing it. And, and like every year, that that would make me itch, Tom. And, and as I got older and talked more about it, it had brackets and all that. I thought even I'm making money on this, sitting at a sports bar, swilling beer at, at Looney's and having a sponsorship. And the kids dribbling the ball aren't making any money. I, to me, no, that no, never I, added up as the way it should have been in America. Well, I mean, and that's that was the inevitability that. You know, I called 30 years ago. They said, look, if you don't slow down the arms race on the management side, expect one on the labor side. And but I don't think the answer in and neither are do our ADs. 96 percent of our ADs felt the arms race was really negative for college sports. They would rather find ways to control all this, to control these outlandish salaries. The worst part of the buyouts, you know, when a coach leaves, they get, you know, five million. I mean. I mean, you can't blame Mark Turgeon, but I'm sure he got close to $5 million. But that's $500 million across college sports in the last 10 years. $500 million. Yeah. Those are colleges and universities. And that's where it gets excessive. And unfortunately, that's what's driven this student-athlete, college-athlete, uh, my demands to get paid. So I um, can't let you run. You're, you're so involved in Maryland. You've been on the Board of <laughs> Regents. Uh, you care mm-hmm. deeply about Maryland sports. What are your thoughts? I mean, there's been so much. I'm not going to ask you to tell me whether you think Turgeon was a good coach, bad coach, X is an O guy, but I am going to ask you to weigh in on what you see as the pressure on major college coaches in, in the major conferences today. And that's, that's the world you live in. And from what I read, that really weighed on Mark and was part of his decision what what's your sense about that pressure today and is it different than what lefty and dean felt or are we just are we just making too much of it let me talk about lefty for a minute to put it in context lefty was someone who said i got complete control of this program it's on me if we don't fill coal field house lefty took responsibility to fill that arena and he did it by his promotion his publicity all that he was the complete college coach because he could not only recruit, he could coach, but he made the program exciting. And, you know, that's the thing that I think a lot of modern coaches, they get into a funnel and they say, yeah, I don't want to do that sales stuff. I don't want to raise money. I don't want to fill the stadium. And, and that was so different from Lefty. Do you remember Cole Fieldhouse, how packed that place was, oh. the atmosphere in that arena? That was because of Coach Drizel. He created that UCLA of the East, that whole environment. Didn't he create Midnight Madness, Tom? Midnight Madness, all that. And so I think that, you know, um, that's a little old-fashioned, but I think that's kind of what you need. And uh, 
And well, well Tom, I would, I would just interrupt to say the LSU coach comes down and adopts a Southern accent in the first yeah. five minutes right. in order to recruit the fan base. Right. And, you know, I don't know what it is, but the recruitment of me being a lifer Baltimorean, I have always been incredibly turned off by going yeah. down to College Park as a media member, just all the way through it. I've never felt a part of it. I felt yeah. not invited, that I didn't have the red hat, you know, and it was never welcoming to me, maybe the yeah. way it was for Don's roommate back in 71. Um, but, but I would just say the recruitment of, Hey, you're in Baltimore. We're at Maryland. It's College Park. It's 30 minutes. Get in the car. It's cold out. We're playing late. We're playing Iowa. We're playing Northwestern. We're playing Nebraska. Come on out, right? That At some point, that has to happen again. The way maybe Gary had a part of that in just winning and getting the building built. And I remember how offended a lot of my friends were that their seats in coal got moved to the roof because they didn't donate enough. And so I remember all of this you know, over the last 25 years. Yeah. But the next thing yeah. has to be to get me in Towson to want to get in my car and come down there and be a part of it. Right. Well, that's that, that, that's that, that's the whole thing. You need to have that that buzz, that thing. And, you know, I mean. Gary was able to win those two back, go back to back. And that made a difference in the program, build a new building, you know, and Mark, Mark was, it's always tough to follow a Gary Williams, you know, and Mark had a, a, a very good winning record, but you know, he really, the, the struggle was always getting to the final four and the sweet 16 and, 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 and the, and the bar has been risen. There's no question about it. It's a very tough job being a college coach today. And I think Mark said, look, you know, this is just too much and let's settle it out and let me go someplace where, uh, you know, it, 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 it may be a better balance. It's also very hard today. You know, Lefty was at Maryland, I think 17 years, very hard for coach to stay along that long that uh, Gary was at Maryland a long time, very hard today to have that kind of longevity. You look at Jim Beheim and Syracuse, you go, wow, that's the only place that guy's ever been. It's incredible that he's been able to, last and prosper that long coach k but you know in the beginning they wanted to fire coach k they wanted to fire dean smith and so you gotta you, you know if maryland's looking for a new coach they've got to find someone that is that complete person that can you know drive the excitement and everything but then you got to give them a little rope and let them build so Hey, Tom, very last basketball wait we could talk for hours we'll get out of yeah. here and let you go you've been gracious you mentioned dean again and, and again, I'm trying to think back because, you know, Jim Thacker, Billy Packer. I mean, that was my thing, man. On Saturday, that was it. You know, ACC basketball. Were, yeah. were you what had we out? Had we put the shot clock in or was was Dean still doing the four corners when you were there? Well, remember that game against South Carolina when the Maryland stalled the ball and then won the game. That was my freshman year. So. No, we did. The shot clock came in later, but so did the three point line. I wish I would have had the three point shot because, uh, you know, it would have made a difference. But all those those things came in later. So there you go. Well, Tom, it's been terrific. Nestor, we knew this walk down memory lane would be a good one. And so now you've had Tom McMillan on more than once. <laughs> well, next time it's going to be a crab cake. I like that you're taller in person, Tom. It's always good to see you there. <laughs> I, I, I'm really appreciative of your time today and the storytelling. It was great to have you on, man. It's good seeing well, you again. It's a pleasure. Congratulations on your reign. 30 years. That's pretty good. Uh, a reign of terror and error, I assure you, man. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate you coming into the old Lord Baltimore studios back in 1993 or 94, whenever that yep. was. And uh, I hope it, it won't be 30 more years before we get together, all yep. right? And, 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 and I'll, I'll see home. you. I'll see you at the birthday party on uh, December 26th. Yeah, absolutely. Lefty90.com. Happy Lefty holidays. .com. Happy holidays. There he goes, Tom McMillan, man. Uh, you know, McMillan, Elmore, Lucas, man, the old days. Uh, the big lefty things happen on the 26th. Uh, we want to make sure everybody goes out and uh, has a smile at lefty's expense because it's uh, it's always fun to smile and tell some old lefty stories. That the, the, the stuff that happened in Springfield a couple years ago, if you haven't Googled that, by all means, go watch the video of that. Uh, it is its own Bob Hope special. I am Nestor. We are WNST AM 1570. Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking. A little turn. A little politics and a little Baltimore positive.com.